We thank you for loving us, for accepting us as your children. So to you we pray that prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. they got it a little bit wrong 
uh, because they were probably thinking he was going to set up shop right then as a political king, when in reality he was going to Jerusalem to be arrested and tried and crucified, dead, buried, put in the grave. And I'm like, wait, that's a really weird way to celebrate your kingdom. Well, what we know now on the other side of it that his resurrection and indicated that that was the power that he was pointing to. That was the real power of the king of the universe. And they didn't get it at the time. So in this Sunday, you know, we kind of celebrate that we know something of Jesus. We kind of get it. But it's an Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, that we celebrate the fullness of the whole shebang, the whole thing that happened. To get us ready for Easter then, a lot of Christians, including us, we have a service on Thursday of this week. So Thursday at 7, we'll have that reenactment of the Last Supper that happened during that holy week. And then on Friday evening, we, we used to do it in the middle of the day, but if, if folks had to work on the Friday, they weren't able to make it here. So we're going to try it in the evening time at 7 o'clock. We come in here, and that's a pretty depressing service. Because this was a very depressing time. The very people that were celebrating that Jesus was king then got to experience his death, his crucifixion on the cross, one of the worst kinds of death. But the more that we lean into that experience, the more meaningful then Easter is, the resurrection. If you just fast forward to the resurrection, you, you miss out on the fact that God understands and entered the worst of human experience, the darkness, that death. God's there. He understands that God has experienced. And so that's what we're doing this week. Thursday, reenactment of the Last Supper with the dramatic reputation. Friday, uh, a service of the darkness where we'll be in here at 7 worshiping God and the fact that God died and that God was on the cross. And then Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. At Easter, I'm going to start a World Religions series, focusing first on that resurrection of Jesus, and then I'm going to go religion, 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 kind of through everything, starting with Judaism the week after that. So I'll give you a little prelude right now. But, but if you've been holding this, and maybe you put it now because you're afraid you're going to hook your own eye or hook somebody behind you, which is actually kind of fun. So if somebody starts falling asleep, just go right there. <laughs> But we need to get some exercise, because each, each Sunday of this series, we've been kind of exercising in some way, shape, or form. So today we're going to do our palm branch waving. Now remember, you go ahead and find them, you know, kind of wake up here. I know. This is good. This is good. Remember, Jesus rode in on the donkey, then he got celebrated as the king, you know. And as we're kind of going back and forth with this, you know, you're remembering that Jesus was celebrated as the king. This is our version of confetti. And they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, woo! You know, and we're very excited. Now, how long are we going to have to do this for this to count as our exercise for the day? <laughs> Half hour. Okay, this is going to be fun for the whole service. Right. Now, you get the idea. And even just doing this, doesn't that make it feel a little more festive? You know, isn't that kind of cool? And we are. We're celebrating that whole idea of Jesus the King in our presence coming in to save the world. Now, that was the story. Now, here's here's. There's a couple of different things that I wanted to get to, and then I'm going to go to Moses back in Exodus. As the people experienced what they did, it was profound enough that they talked about it and talked about it. It's called the oral tradition. They talked about it, and then other people talked about it, and they started passing down the story of what happened uh, and with Jesus in that whole holy week in the Easter oral tradition. Talking, 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 because based on the people's experience, experience is a big deal. It turned history upside down, gave us the basis of our faith. And, um, and Jesus, then, is the focus of that whole experience. But the bedrock, the foundation for that whole thing was laid 1,500 years prior to that in the life of Moses, who is the most important person for the Jewish people. And remember, Jesus came as a Jewish man. These are Jewish folks in Jerusalem. So now you're seeing the connection. I'm going back in time to help us understand present time. So if we go back in time, and this is a great thing for those of you that play, you know, along on Jeopardy, or you're playing trivia crack against each other, <coughs> you challenge me, you know. If there's ever a question, who's the most important person in Judaism? The answer is, starts with an M, and it's Moses. Moses. Why? Because it was through Moses that the Ten Commandments were given by God on the stone tablets. You remember that story? And then also he was inspired to write a whole bunch of other things that made it into the Bible, including a bunch of other laws. And that law, then, the compilation thereof, is the basis of Judaism even to today. It interpreted it differently from different you know, kind of group to group and throughout.
throughout the years, but this is the basis. So let's go to the next slide and think about this guy Moses. Now there he is with the Ten Commandments, and uh, his story is back in Exodus, although he undoubtedly wrote a whole lot of different parts of the Old Testament there, first of five books and so forth. Um, and so, um, you know, and, and scholars debate about, you know, what exactly he wrote, but, uh, but this, the story there is very, very clear that this is the guy that God chose to speak to on behalf of all these Israelite people. We would call them the Jews today. So God's going to speak through him and to be able to help to then arrange a covenant between God and this guy. Now, now Moses, you may, you know, some of these stories, if you grew up in Sunday school and stuff, you might, you might remember different parts of his life. One of the most famous parts is the burning bush. So Moses is a shepherd. This is kind of later in his life. He's an older guy. And he's off in kind of the hillside taking care of sheep. And he sees this bush that's burning, but it's not being burned up. It's not being consumed. Now that, for any of us, would be like, whoa, I've got to go check that out, right? You know, if you're out walking in the woods, you see this fire, you know, you start maybe wanting to run from the fire, but then if you look at it, you're like, wait a second, it doesn't seem to be smoking and burning up like normal. I'd go check it out, right? So that's what he does. And then God speaks to him through that experience. Again, experience. And here's God. And God says to him, Moses, I want you to go down into Egypt and tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. And you're like, okay, what's, what's behind that? Why is that a big deal? Well, remember, the Pharaoh is the most powerful guy in this whole region. Moses would have undoubtedly thought this is the most powerful guy in the whole world. And he could have me killed right on the spot if he wants to. And my message to Pharaoh, hey, your entire labor force that you're exploiting for your own economic benefit, they all get not just the day off, but they all get to walk off the job entirely to go off and start their new country. How, how well is that going to go over with Pharaoh? <laughs> Not very well, right? You know, he's going to be like, wait a second, now I've got to go find more slaves from some other place or I've got to start getting my own Egyptians to work. I don't think this is going to go over well at all. And so Moses, understandably, is like, I'm not real thrilled with this task that you've got for me. Now, if you think about yourself, are there things that God wants you to do in life that would be in service to God and to humanity? Somehow you're supposed to help people. Somehow you're supposed to love other people. Jesus is teaching us hundreds of years later, but it was consistent with the Old Testament understanding. We're not here just for ourselves, but we're here to love God and to love other people. So much here for people. And have you ever had an experience where you thought God wanted you to do something, but you're like, ah, I'm not sure if that's for me. <laughs> you know? God puts it on your heart, and you think, ah, maybe I'm supposed to do that, but maybe I'm not supposed to. This happens to me every time in this type of time of year when people are trying to get coaches for like Little League and the soccer teams and stuff. And how many of you parents sit back and you're like, I'm going to wait and see if other parents will step forward? Am I the only one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And then it's that third email from the organization that says, hey, we're still looking for coaches. And then you realize, oh, maybe God wants me to do that. Well, but some of you, it's just right automatic. But some of us, it, we struggle because of time or, you know, thinking, well, there might be some better person for it than me. It's not just with coaching, though. It may be just cooking a meal for that person that's hurting. You know, it's kind of on your mind. If you're like, ah, I'm not sure I really have time to do that. Or reaching out to that person that other people are kind of leaving alone or discriminating against or something. But God's like, you know, you need to reach out to that person. You know, like, ah. I'm not real suited for that. I don't really, I'm not real outgoing. I don't speak right, you know. But God puts it on your on your heart. This is Moses' experience. It's like, I'm not sure I'd go back. So let's go to the next slide because we've got some of his excuses. In Exodus 3. Now remember, this is Moses talking to God. How well does a bargain between you and God go? You know, when you're arguing against God, you know, who, who's got the upper hand here? I will not play trivia crack. If God's Facebook page you know, shows up, then I'm going to go against God. But I'm not going to do that. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But um, so who am I? He's like, God, who am I to go talk to the most powerful man in the universe right now? You know, this is ridiculous. I'm a nobody. I'm out here watching sheep. And if you know why he was out there watching sheep, you know he was a fugitive. He'd grown up in Egypt and he'd killed a guy to protect one of his own ethnic people. Moses is Jewish, 
He grew up in an Egyptian household. Now this might be clicking for some of you that were raised in Sunday school. Remember, he was the little baby in the, in, in the, the basket, you know? Yep, he goes off and, you know, his mom's like, hey, the Egyptians are killing us, us Hebrew uh, people, especially the little baby boys. I don't want my baby boy to be killed, so she put him in the basket, just sent him down the river. She's like, if they come to my house and they find this baby, they're going to kill it. Maybe somebody down the river can take care of it. And who took care of the baby? The Pharaoh's daughter. She's like, I, I'm going to adopt this kid, in it, but I'm, I'm not prepared to nurse this child. I need to go find a Hebrew that can nurse this child for me. Goes back to the baby's mother, you know, that remember this whole story. So Moses gets raised in two different cultures. He's multicultural. He's, he's basically bilingual and bi-ethnic. You know, he's born a Hebrew, raised initially and weaned as a Hebrew, but then later is in the Egyptian household. I'm going to review this all in just a second again. But it, it's a pretty wild thing. So who am I? Well, God's probably sitting back going, well, you're like the perfect person for this. You know, like, what are you, what are you why are you even arguing with me? God's like, you're perfect for this, but Moses doesn't see it. He's like, who am I? They're not going to believe me. When I go tell the Israelites, hey, I'm supposed to lead you out of Egypt, they're going to freak out. They're going to say, yeah, right, you're a wanted fugitive. You're a murderer. You know, this is never going to work. He says, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak right. We don't know if he had a speech impediment, or whether he stuttered, or whether he just had trouble kind of putting into words the ideas in his head, but he's self-conscious about that. And then he says, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Again, it's bargaining with, you, with, with God, but you have and I have them probably. You probably bargain with God. You know, I'm not sure I'm the right person. I'm not sure I can do this and so forth. And, and so Mo, those are Moses' excuses. So now let's go to the next slide. Now we're going to dig into Exodus 4. Let me sit down for a second and let Mark read these words. This is the, the final exchange here between God and Moses. And let's listen. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what, to, what you shall speak. But Moses said, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, Levi? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him, and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand his the staff with which he shall do his arms. Notice up there in the top right hand corner, if you can read that, it says stop the excuses. Now that's not from the actual text, but that's a little bit of the message of God, right? God's like, look, I made everything. I know better than you. To do what you are called to do. And at the very end of it, he's like, Look, I'll even make a couple of concessions for you. You say you can't speak well and you have more confidence in your brother's speaking ability. Well, fine. Then I'll partner him with you and he can speak. You tell him what I tell you, Moses, and then he'll tell everyone else and you'll have more confidence. Fine. I'll do that. And not only that, but then he gives him the staff, or if you know the story or you saw the movie, you got this whole idea that. God enables him to use the staff to do certain miracles. So before he's even sent to do the task that he was shaped by God to do, God gives him miracles in addition to talking to him. So let's go to the next slide. You've got this whole idea then, that Moses is the perfect guy for this, but he's trying to make excuses. His experiences throughout life have shaped him for exactly what God wants him to do, but he, he was like blinded to admit it. He was born and weaned in Israel, a Hebrew. So the people he's going to lead out of slavery, he's one of them. And he was adopted into the Egyptian pharaoh's family. So he also understood Egyptian culture. He understood the language. He understood the mannerisms. I mean, this is the perfect guy for this task. 
He was strong and brave and bold, which had been used, so his personality was like that, and he got in trouble because he had killed a guy and then became a wanted fugitive. But if you've got a criminal past, you might understand that God can take some of that old self that got you in trouble and turn it sideways and then use it for good. You know what I'm talking about? You know? You were a strong person, you're a strong personality, and God kind of turns that around so that instead of helping people, or I mean, instead of hurting people, now you're helping people. And you've got a boldness about that, and you've got courage to do that, and you go into parts of town that other people might be scared of or whatever, and you're walking by saying, hey, what's up? You know, you know people. Or maybe you just understand, you know, when God can take that experience, turn them on the side, and then enable you then to be the perfect person for what God has shaped you to do. He's comfortable being alone, leading sheep. If you've ever tried to do that, which I have not, but I can imagine, you're out there, and you're watching the sheep. And the sun goes up, and the sun goes down, and nobody wants to hang around you because you smell like sheep and stuff, right? And so you're really used to being alone. You go to town, and people just kind of stay away from you, you know? Well, guess what? When he was a leader, and everybody else wanted to go back to Egypt, and they're like, wow, freedom's not what I thought it would be. Remember when we had cucumbers back in Egypt? Wouldn't it be nice to go back to Egypt? He had to stand alone and say, hey, dumb sheep, let's keep going to the promised land. What are you talking about? You know, He was used to being alone. God used that. God used that. He talked with God and it was given the help of his brother and he was given miracles from God. He put all that together. Was Moses exactly the right guy for the task? Yeah. And so is there something that God's put on your heart to do for other people somehow help them. Where at this point, you may step back and say, God, are there experiences in my life that have been preparing me that I just I take it for granted or I haven't noticed, I haven't seen? You know? Is, is, am I actually more ready for what you've got for me right now than I thought? Is there some, some experience here that, that God's using with you and with me? So let's go to the next slide. The whole idea of this series of getting in the shape to empower us and encourage us to do what God's called us to do. How God has shaped you and me to help other people and love them. Because remember, Jesus boiled it all down to the two commandments. Love God, love you, love your neighbor as yourself. So as you're, as you're trying to love other people on behalf of God, God has shaped you to be able to do that. As you do that, you find out you have spiritual gifts that you may not have even realized you had. Oh my gosh, I'm now able to do this more because God's working through me. You may care about things even more deeply. You know? And you're like, look, I don't know why I care so much about the kids at this school. Or I don't know why I care so much about making people feel welcome at church. Or I don't know why I care so much about this particular issue in our world. But I do. And I care deeply. So where did that come from? Well, God may have put that right there for you to follow and to help other people. He may have given you the right abilities to be able to do what God wants you to do. And the right personality for it. And say, wait. I've been trying it this way, but it doesn't seem to be right, you know. And maybe your personality is a little different, and you've got to come at that a little different. You know? And now this whole experience idea. The pastor Rick Warren says, God will never waste effort. I'm going to say that again. That's really profound. God will never waste effort. Because sometimes our background has been so painful, or there's been something that just kind of keeps coming up, you know, and it's just so hurtful. This point is God. God is going to use that for good somehow, eventually. And it may be that somebody else that experiences some deep hurt like that, nobody else in the whole community seems to understand it as well as you do. And you're now just the right person to help. You, know, you grew up in that situation. Now you're able to help. You've been dealing with this right now, and now you're able to help others that have been through that. And so it may be the hurt that God uses. Maybe the blessing that God's given you. Maybe the special interaction with God that God has somehow done for you in the past. But like Moses, you've been shaped to be able to help people in a very specific way. How cool is that? How cool is that? And so when you go out of here today, and you go out saying, you know what? As I think about Easter and the resurrection story, that power of the resurrection can be lived through me in some way that I, I can help other people and I can love them. And I've been shaped in a particular way to help people around me. 
So I don't care what other people say about me or what they say I can't do. Somehow God has shaped me to help others and it's powerful. Now around the, the sanctuary here I've got the signs. And they're the same ones that were up last week. And remember what I said, these are not the only ways to serve people in this church. And they sure are not the only ways that God can shape you to serve other people. They're just examples of some things that right immediately, you know, we've got some needs for. And if you wanted to jump in on, you can. Okay? But remember, there are many other ways. We had two different funerals this past couple of weeks. And some people had fixed meals, you know, for folks and stuff. That's not up here, but it's not because it's any less important. You understand? Or like the ladies that do the, um, the gift card over here in the library, you know, where you, you buy something and that money goes and help other people, and that's really, really cool. So I don't have that up there, but go, go help them out, you know, and talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So if you wanted to join the choir, you can come over here in the corner, okay, and say, hey, will somebody talk to me about the choir? All right. You guys will talk to me. Okay. And if you want to do some kids' ministry, you can come right up here and do some kids' ministry. On Sunday or vacation Bible school, we've got both of those needs right immediately that we're getting ready for. You wanted to tutor kids, Styles Elementary School, three, three different afternoons. You can pick from any of them or do all of them. You can come right up there, okay? And you can stand right here where I preach. Ooh! So the ones up here are fun. Ooh! See what that is like. Same over here for visitation and prayers. If you wanted to visit folks that are homebound or hospitalized, come right over here. There's a little display. You can sign up for different things. Or if you want to pray for the prayer requests throughout the week, you can be a part of the praying. Um, if you want to be a part of uh, praying for folks after the worship services, we do that as well. And so Pastor Phil will be up here talking about all of those. Then in the back, back in that corner, it says maintenance crew. And then next to that, it says landscaping and grounds. So if you love doing stuff with your hands and come fix stuff in the back of that corner, if you, if you love being outside, um, landscaping and grounds, you can be right there. Right there where the guy in the pink shirt is, that's Ron right over there. It might be red, I don't know, the light and stuff, that's Ron. So over there is talking about greeters and ushers and so forth. Where's Betty, 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 Betty? All right, so you'll be back there making sure we get stuff, you know, written down too. Okay, good. I've got I've got um, papers too, so we'll get those back there. That'll be perfect. Set up and tear down um, throughout the week. If you're um, able to do that, that's an unusual one that a lot of folks can't do. But but throughout the week, if you've got a flex schedule, then you can help me set up and tear down and do that. We're not going to break right now in the middle of the service. We're just going to do that at the very end of the service when everybody's leaving. So you can kind of go to your spot. Um, who knows what else God put on your heart? Oh my gosh, I'd love to do testimonies. And just hear person after person to say, this is what God's called me to do. It's just awesome. Absolutely powerful. Uh, and there's so many other ways. I don't know. Let's take a vote. Everybody in favor of Ken speaking right now. So yeah. All right, all right. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, but come up here, come up here. Yeah. All I'm going to say is this. If there's anybody that has a problem getting to one of those locations when we do this, raise your hand, and, and I'll come around and talk to you and ask you what you might be interested in. Okay? I love it. Thank you. So if you can't get to one of these and have some mobility issues, there are multiple different ways you can serve as well, um, and relating to a lot of these or not. And so Ken will come help and talk to you. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Becky, would you stand just for a second and spread down? So Becky, in terms of cafe help, um, food preparation and stuff, I can back to the world to do that as well. Okay? All right. Now. Um, let me pray, and then, then we'll turn it over to Mark for the rest of the service and the offerings. Lord, we've got a lot of hands and feet right here. And we've got some big hearts of people that um, maybe their hands or their feet aren't working quite like they used to, but Lord, they are ready to serve you, to pray for people or call people or new cards or who knows what. And so Lord, as we are willing to do what you want us to do, you inspire us and give us little ideas that we might even think were our ideas at first, but then as we start doing them, we realize, wait, that came from you. So give us the ideas, give us the courage to follow what you want us to do, like Moses did. We love you. We 